Good afternoon to you, Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com. It is time for the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion. It is now the 16th day of July 2020. I hope your Thursday is going well. I got a lot for you today, so let's get right to it, shall we? First of all, in the um, satellite area, we'll start with that. Nothing going on. All right, so if you want to drop off and continue to do whatever it is that you were doing before you started watching this, now is a good time to do so because no, we don't have anything threatening over the next several days. But if you want to continue on and learn a few things that are pretty interesting, I think, then let's get on with it, shall we? Uh, no, there's nothing happening right now. We can see a little bit of convection here in the southeastern Pacific. This is your upward motion trying to you know work its magic there, but nothing really consolidating. Curious little area of convection up here around Louisiana that we'll have to watch. I mean, any area of vorticity or concentrated spin or energy near a body of water and certainly over that body of water this time of the year, especially when that water is as warm as we're seeing in the Gulf, you got to watch it. Uh, other than that, pretty good flow of trades coming into the Caribbean, uh, but you know, no substantial tropical waves to speak of, nothing to worry about in the next several days. As we widen our perspective and look out further to the, or farther to the east, um, monsoon trough off the coast of Africa, very prevalent. And again, no really discernible, convectively active tropical waves moving through, just the brisk trades coming through. Uh, so just a few pop-up showers here and there, but nothing organized for the time being. We still have the very strong Saharan air layer uh, dominant, and you can see that it, it, it definitely extends farther to the north now. Uh, up towards the um, Azores and the Canary Islands over here. Uh, and it is retreating. We're going to look at that in more detail in a moment. So nothing going on for the time being. So let's take a look at a few things that are really interesting here. These are your upper ocean heat content values. And you notice what the URL says. This is day 197 of the year 2020. All right. So this is 2020, day 197. This is July 16th. Actually, it updates the day before, so this is the 15th. And you can see that the Gulf is very warm. Uh, we know that already. These upper ocean heat content values are, they're pretty high. And uh, very, very high down here in the Caribbean. Now real quick, what does that mean? So let me just give you an example. If you were to take a boat and go about 20 miles offshore from Gulf Shores, Alabama, Galveston, Texas, Tampa, wherever, Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, you go 20, 25 miles offshore, you jump in and you dive down 10 feet or so. That's about as far down as you can go uh, where you don't have to have, you know, um, you don't have to worry about your ears popping and all that kind of thing. The very top of the ocean, that's the skin. You dive down, you come back up. We've all done that. I'd like, I like to do that. I don't usually get to go out in a boat, but you get the idea. That's the top of the ocean and that's nice and warm. If you dive deep enough in some of those instances, you can feel that colder water when you go down and you come back up. But oftentimes, especially this time of year, you start to not be able to do that. That is the upper ocean heat content that we're talking about there. It's not just the skin, it's what's below that. And in this case, we're talking many tens of meters down, 50 meters, 100 meters, 200 meters deep. How, down, how far down, how deep into the water column does that 80 degree isotherm extend? The deeper it is, 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 26 Celsius or so, the deeper that is, the more warm water there is for a hurricane to churn and bring up and sort of slough off all that energy, all that latent heat. It's an amazing process. And that's what this map shows us using these color codes. Where are the ocean heat content values the highest? That would be the color white. And we can see down here in the Caribbean, it's exceptional. The Florida Straits, very high. Rest of the Gulf of Mexico, as you would expect, also quite high. So let's broaden this out. Let's take a look at the whole Atlantic Basin here. And you notice that the upper ocean heat content values are very high right up against the coastline there. It's not often that you get to see that. Usually there's a little bit of shelf water there. Uh, especially along the Atlantic. And you can see that down here in the, in the Gulf. There's some of these areas that kind of poke out and chisel into that 
upper ocean heat content. But this is very, very prevalent. This is a very solid sign. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to use, um, let's use purple here, violet, and just kind of outline this right here. And I'll show you. I'm just going to generalize it so we can move on. Keep your eye on this line that I have drawn, all right? So this is what we have today. How do we compare it day 197 one year ago? All right, let's take it back a year. Look at that. That's where we, the purple is where we are now. I can just do this, of course. But that's pretty remarkable. Quite a big difference. It's definitely higher this year. What about 2020 versus three years ago? Actually, that says 2007, doesn't it? That's so frustrating. That's all right. We'll get rid of that. Uh, let's see if I can type it in here without this just screwing up on me. Do, 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 do. I don't know how I did that. I'm getting old. But we can fix it. Boom. So there's 2017. How was it three years ago? It's what we call next play. You just go on. You made a mistake, you keep going. Um, and uh, it's, you know, similar to 2017. <laughs> not not 2007. Uh, but it is neat that they have those in the archive if you want to look for it. So here it is now, 2020. Here it was, 2017. Definitely more this year. I think we can all agree to that overall, especially in the western part of the basin. Uh, why is that important? Because again, the more upper ocean heat content we have, the more energy is available for tropical cyclones, especially hurricanes and intense hurricanes, to whip up that water. They make those waves, the wind blows across the surface, and it's just wicking up, if you will, more warm water. And that's what this shows us very, very clearly as we compare. Wow, that's something else. All right. So how about anything taking advantage of it? No, nothing anytime soon. Weak areas of vorticity lined up out here. There's that one curious feature off of Louisiana. You never know. You know, the water temperatures over here are very, very warm. You, you can't just ignore those, but it's, we'll see. Um, it's just a small little mesoscale convective complex, meaning fancy word for large, somewhat organized uh, area of thunderstorms. Instead of just a singular thunderstorm, like sitting right over Raleigh or Dallas or something, you know, this is pretty large, relatively speaking, but it's not, you know, particularly organized, but we'll see. Stranger things have happened. Uh, so nothing happening really right now. And another way to look at all of this, I love this product, the precipitable water animation here um, from the University of Wisconsin. And this shows that very, very prevalent fetch of moisture down here in the intertropical convergence zone is getting bent and turned more towards the north. Here's that dry Saharan air. And that's much more northward displaced than we have seen. Look, there's more moisture out here in the main development region. Now, there's still some dry air embedded in there, but I mean, come on. It's mid-July. These Saharan air outbreaks usually continue right on into mid-August. Another month of this is what is supposed to happen, you know, climatologically speaking, uh, but it's getting there. That's for sure. We'll, we'll continue to watch this, and it'll be really fascinating. You'll see it you know, when one of these comes off and then they curl up all the way, and then it'll look like a ball. And then we can see it very readily apparent on the vorticity signature here. Not yet, but it's coming probably within the next few weeks. And here's the source of it. Upward motion firmly entrenched over a good part of the Indian Ocean over here. And then that upward motion helping to fuel these thunderstorms and the strong African easterly jet that's coming out this way. Eh, probably around 700 millibars in the atmosphere or so, several thousand feet up. And then at the low levels, we're getting a lower level around 5,000 feet of westerly wind coming in, and that helps to create that cyclonic, that turning that we get, and it energizes those tropical waves. And look at this, another big clue as to what's coming if you know your latitude and longitude, folks, I mean, come on, up here in the northwest part of Africa, Morocco, that area, not far from the Canary Islands, and these thunderstorms in here, what do thunderstorms do? They rain. What does rain do? It moistens the ground. 
it's all coming together. There's another cluster there. Uh, I mean, it's just a matter of time. We've talked about this. This is not a surprise. It's nothing to worry about. This is what we have seen coming for months, and that is remarkable that we can see these signals in the climate guidance, and now we're seeing it come to fruition. Yes, I know it's frustrating when they talk about 50 to 100 years out that the polar ice caps could melt, and I get that. That's so far out in time, you know, but you got to start somewhere. And this sub-seasonal stuff, and yeah, that's a topic for another day. You talk about wanting to get people all riled up. Politics, religion, and climate change. And now I guess the COVID-19 thing. We're not going there. This is where the science is really doing well. Uh, that we can focus on. This is my area of expertise, that is, and because we can see it. The climate models were showing it, and here it is happening in front of our eyes, and it's a slow progression towards what we are pretty sure, pretty sure is going to happen in August, September, and beyond. Anything over the next week or so? Well, this is the Euro uh, from the 12Z run today, west coast of Africa. Let's get it to where you can see it, shall we? West coast of Africa right there. Uh, east coast of North America over here, anything in between. Remember, we're looking for these little areas of vorticity to kind of ball up. Instead of being stretched out, do they bundle? This is every 24 hours, so let's move through. Day one, this is valid Friday morning, Saturday morning, Sunday morning. And look, just real quick, you can clearly see that turning that I was telling you about, right? There's the westerly part. Here's the easterly part, and then you get that, you know, these tropical waves that roll off between that. Uh, it's like rolling a pencil top along a table, a pencil top, a pencil along a tabletop. Similar, it's kind of like that. It, it helps to get the vorticity going, put it that way, uh, that monsoonal shift. Anyway, that's 72 hours. That's Sunday morning. There's Monday morning, Tuesday morning, so we're down now five days out. This will be an interesting feature to watch, this and this, as to where they end up. And uh, that's day five, here's day six, there's day seven. So in a week, we should have a fairly potent tropical wave approaching the Leeward Islands, the Lesser Antilles. And it's going to be situated on the southwest side of a very strong area of high pressure out over the Atlantic. Clearly, you can see that. And we'll just see where this ends up. Maybe it's there, maybe it's not, maybe it's stronger, maybe it's weaker. But you can definitely see that little piece of energy right there in the European. Other models are showing this as well. You know, does it end up over here somewhere? You know, you can go see yourself. Uh, does it break apart and part of it moves into the Caribbean? Or what? Will the Saharan air be too strong out here? Well, that's so far out in time, we don't know for sure. But this is what I'm talking about, that we get a signal, just a little hint. You know, we're talking seven days out that maybe we have some inclement weather to worry about. I don't worry, there's that word. I, I don't like saying worry. To watch for, there we go. Um, if you're worried, that means you don't understand it. And we're trying to get you to understand things here. So we'll watch for that. Also, speaking of watching, uh, as we check in here with Ben Knoll, uh, the JMA weeklies, look at this. Uh, that's week four. Let's start here at week one, and I figured out if I click on it, it does stop. So there's week one. This is the upward motion. Green is rising air, and the whatever color that is, sort of rusty something another, <laughs> orange, I don't know, not green, is sinking air. And here is the, uh, here's Africa right here. So week one, this is July 17th to the 24th, so it's basically now. The rising motion is over Africa, and this is a Mercator projection map, so it's stretched out. It's like a big piece of paper, all right? And you notice basically sinking galore over the Atlantic Basin. That's the bottom line here. So now let's look at week two. All right, so there's week two. This gets us the 25th of July through the 1st of August. This is the area starting to expand out now into the Atlantic. Let's move along. Let's look at week three. There's week three. It expands even more. And by week four, it looks like it would be, I hate saying game on because that diminishes the importance of this, but you get what I'm saying. Switch on, whatever. The upward motion 
extends out across the Atlantic Basin, sinking motion in the Pacific, plus for the Atlantic, minus for the Pacific. I'm telling you, the signals are just, I mean, if it doesn't happen, once we get into August and beyond, well, obviously something's wrong. But the signals here are extremely powerful. And hopefully, I'm still trying to coordinate this, we're going to have Ben on a special edition of Hurricane U tomorrow, Friday, around 5 p.m. Eastern Time. I'm still trying to confirm it. you got to remember, Ben lives and works in New Zealand. So if it's 5 p.m. Eastern Time, that's around 9 a.m. the next day for him. 9 a.m. Saturday in New Zealand, right? And he sleeps in on Saturday. He should. Um, and uh, you need your rest. That's We all can agree with that. So I'm still trying to coordinate that, but it's looking pretty good. I'll talk about that for sure tomorrow during the update. But I want to have Ben on for a special edition of Hurricane U where we discuss what are these weeklies that we hear about? What is upward motion? How do the models see this? What does all this mean? Um, you know, so kind of focusing on this sub-seasonal content. I think that's the best thing to do uh, since we're going to hear a lot about it coming up. So stay tuned to that and for that tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. New Zealand time. <laughs> all right. Wow. That's amazing, isn't it? And we're going to do it either over Zoom or FaceTime. And as long as the Internet connection holds for both of us, you'll see it's remarkable. He's like, what, 12,000 miles away or something like that? And it'll be like he's in the other room. Amazing what we can do today. All right, so there you go, you know, quiet, but we see the signs coming. You hear it over and over again, but pretty soon we will be tracking the G storm, the H storm, the I storm, and so forth and so on. And I just want you to be ready so that it, you, you can handle it as it comes. All right, that's all I'm here for. And then we go out and tackle them in the field when they do approach, but that comes later. Have a great rest of your Thursday. As always, thank you for tuning in and listening to me. I appreciate your time as, uh, as, as any time, right? Uh, I am Mark Sedith for HurricaneTrack.com. I'll be back with more for you tomorrow.